Hello, everyone, and warm welcome to the webinar Doing Business in Ukraine, the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement and Market Opportunities for BC Companies by the BC Government. My name is Ganna Drost. I'm manager in the Trade Policy and Negotiations Branch, BC Ministry of Jobs, Economic Development and Competitiveness. I'm joined today by my colleague Benjamin Kolisnik, senior manager in the same branch, and by our distinguished guests, Adam Barbalat, Commercial Counselor and Senior Trade Commissioner at the Embassy of Canada in Ukraine, Petro Petrenko, Trade Commissioner and Counselor at the Embassy of Ukraine in Canada, um, and Svetoslav Kavetsky, Executive Director at the Canada-Ukraine Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for connecting from Kyiv, Ottawa and Toronto today and making yourself available for the British Columbian businesses. We are so pleased to have you with us. The idea for this webinar emerged to celebrate the anniversary of the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement, which marked three years on August 1st. Uh, and we hope to have an interesting discussion today about opportunities for BC companies in this largest con country in Europe. So before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so that you know what to expect and how to participate in today's interactive session. The webinar will last approximately one hour. There will be four presentations in total. We will start uh, with a quick intro into uh, free trade agreements and we'll spend more time on the Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement. And then we'll move to doing business in Ukraine and how BC companies can take advantage of business opportunities there. These two presentations will take approximately 20 minutes each and will be delivered by Adam and I. Uh, you will have an opportunity to learn why BC is important for Ukraine from a short and sweet presentation by Petro. And then Svetoslav will walk us through the support that Canada-Ukraine Chamber of Commerce is offering uh, to intensify Canada-Ukraine trade and through some of their initiatives. So you will have an opportunity uh, to submit text questions to presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar, or we will follow up with you individually if we run out of time. Uh, you may also wish to explore the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel, where you will find today's presentation deck, uh, information on government procurement in Ukraine, and Canada's international free trade agreements application in different sectors. You will receive a recording of today's webinar along with presentations in a follow-up email and we will be switching off our cameras for the time of presentation and we'll turn them back for the Q&A session. So let's get started. The branch I work in represents BC interests in free trade agreement negotiations, trade disputes affecting BC and we also work to increase businesses awareness of the opportunities in FTAs. And the things we plan to discuss today will be of interest if you are currently exporting or interested in exporting goods and services to Ukraine. And it also applies to you if you import these goods and services. We know we have a diverse audience today and some of you are already exporting or about to start exporting to Ukraine. Others are about to start production there, while others were exporting from Ukraine in the past. And we hope to make this session interesting uh, for all of you. Uh, so today we'll go over a little uh, about our ministry, what free trade agreements do, uh, Canada's Ukraine free trade agreement, uh, what opportunities it offers for goods and government procurement sectors, and I will also show you some uh, useful tools and resources. Uh, we understand that uh, free trade agreements are long, complex and technical, and we are here to help you to navigate their web. The good thing is that we will have time for questions later on, and if in the future, you have questions or concerns, you can contact me or our branch or any of the offices and resources that I'll show you at the end of the presentation. So the Ministry of Jobs, Economic Development and Competitiveness aims to make life more affordable for British Columbians by building a strong, a sustainable economy and improve the standard of living. And there are many ways to foster this economic growth. One way is to encourage businesses to leverage the opportunities found in FTAs and in international markets. And that's our job today. Uh, with that, I'd like to kick it off with a short video uh, from the Minister of State for Trade. 
Hello, I'm George Chow, Minister of State for Trade. I'm pleased to add my support and welcome you to this session. The goal for this session is to share the benefits and opportunity of Canada's domestic and international free trade agreements, and to ensure that everyone in BC's diverse regions, communities, and sectors receive the information needed. Free trade agreements help open new markets as well as advance and protect BC's competitive advantages. They are a critical part of attracting new investment into BC's regions. They apply to all sectors of the economy, including forestry, agricultural, intellectual property, clean tech, and mining, to name just a few. I'm proud to say that last year, we held close to 50 information sessions like this one with approximately 1,500 participants covering all of BC's regions. We have also held sessions for Indigenous businesses and women-owned businesses. Now, because of COVID-19, we are continuing the webinars, and my hope is we can resume in-person sessions when the time is right. The COVID-19 pandemic has made international trade much more challenging for the foreseeable future. Thankfully, the very good news is Canada has 14 free trade agreements covering 51 countries, including a new Canada-US-Mexico agreement and agreement with the European Union, Japan, Korea, and many others that, if used correctly, can help lower your costs and provide much needed certainty in these uncertain times. Free trade agreements are complex. My staff are here today to help you understand how they work. I want to ensure that you are supported as you plan for the future. We're also offering help with export and trade readiness through our Export Navigator program. And we have in-market experts and other resources available in Canada that you will hear about today. I wish you all a successful info session. Thank you. So first, uh, let's start with, uh, let's see what free trade agreements uh, or FTAs do. Uh, you may have heard of the World Trade Organization or WTO. Uh, the WTO is the foundation of global trade. It sets the rules of trade between nations and FTAs build on the commitments made by countries, uh, by country members at the WTO. And FTAs in simple terms, this is an agreement between two or more countries to facilitate trade and eliminate trade barriers between them. So how do FTAs do this? A common way to do this is by offering a better or preferential terms, preferential tariff rates, transparent and non-discriminatory access to a bilateral FTA partner. So some FTAs cover only goods, while others include services, investment, government procurement, and other areas. FTAs are also changing and they are becoming more comprehensive to cover things like SMEs, e-commerce and inclusive trade. And it is important to remember that FTAs are a two-way street. We take on the obligations, but our FTA partners take them on as well. And FTAs also provide a means to sue a trading partner in case of a breach of the agreement. So now uh, let's have a quick look at Canada's international free trade agreements. This map shows you where in the world Canada's FTAs have been implemented. This, these countries are in light blue. Uh, Ukraine, for example, uh, US, European Union, Australia, uh, where free trade agreements have been concluded but not yet implemented. These countries are in dark blue. Uh, in purple, you will see countries that have both in force and not yet ratified FTAs with Canada. And this is the case of Chile and Peru. So some FTAs are bilateral, others are multilateral, and some FTAs overlap. This is also reflected on the map with the stripe pattern. For example, Canada is in FTA with Mexico through Canada-US-Mexico agreement, and also, also through a comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, the good news for you is that FTAs do not cancel one another, and you can choose under which FTA you want to claim preferential terms of trade. Canada has a key first mover advantage as the only country to have FTA, uh, FTAs with all other countries in J7, the US, UK, France, Germany, Italy, and Japan. However, this preference will not last forever, so it is important to get 
the most out of it now. So now let's see why the Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement is so important for Canada and BC. Uh, Bikufta, a Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement, entered into force on August 1st, 2017, and it was a historic agreement for both countries that already enjoyed a close relationship with strong people-to-people -people ties dating back to over a century. Bikufta was actually Canada's second FTA in Europe and the first bilateral FTA in Europe. So why is it important for BC? Well, over the past three years, BC exported to Ukraine more than any other Canadian province. And while a good share of those uh, goods were energy goods, BC has already uh, seen an overall export growth with some export gains in several other key sectors, such as fish and seafood, pet food, pork products, and some machinery. And for example, uh, as a recent example, in January, July 2020, Ukraine was the fifth largest destination for BC fish and seafood exports by value. And despite the slowdown in the international trade due to the COVID pandemic, Ukraine's market demonstrated over 17% growth of fish and seafood imports from BC over the same period in 2019. And this is a very positive sign. Uh, so studies have shown that uh, once fully implemented, Kufta might increase goods exports from BC and Canada to Ukraine by 19%. And under the Kufta, uh, BC and Canadian exporters now benefit from a level playing field with the uh, European companies that already enjoyed a duty-free access to the Ukrainian market. And another favorable aspect of the Kufta is the uh, competitive advantage it gives Canadian uh, companies over US, Chinese, and Turkish competitors could, could do not have an FTA with Ukraine. And it's also important to note that as of now, uh, the Kufta covers goods, government procurement, intellectual property, digital trade, environment, labor and dispute settlement. Uh, however, there is a discussion between the Ukrainian and Canadian governments over potential modernization of the Kufta and uh, modernized Kufta could increase the agreement's benefits for Canadian companies even further. But I will leave it to Adam uh, to provide us uh, an update on that. Um, so what does the Kufta offer has to offer you? Um, let's begin with the tariff reductions, which reduce the costs of your products and make them more competitive. Uh, overall, the Kufta eliminated tariffs on 86% of Canadian goods, and many goods will become duty-free by January 2024, when the Kufta is fully implemented. So if someone told you that your blueberries will be 20% cheaper or your pet food will be 10% cheaper by 2024, and the tariffs of, again, 20% of uncertain varieties on fish were gone under the Kufta, making your products cheaper than those of competitors, that's uh, pretty compelling. And these tariff reductions, uh, they also reduce the costs of imports into Canada. So you may find some technology or input that can be brought in cheaper from Ukraine, saving you some money. And as you can see from this slide, under the Kufta, Ukraine immediately eliminated all tariffs on fish and seafood products, including tariffs on prepared and preserved fish and seafood, such as caviar and dead substitutes, uh, fresh, chilled and frozen fish. Uh, same goes for metal and energy products. Can, uh, Kufta has eliminated tariffs on all Canadian metal and energy exports. Uh, Ukraine also eliminated the vast majority of its agricultural tariffs. And Ukraine's tariffs on Canada's dairy products will be either reduced or eliminated over time. And Ukraine's tariff on wine and ice wine uh, was also eliminated immediately upon um, Kufta's entry into force. Uh, all of Canada's current forestry products uh, exports to Ukraine already benefit from immediate duty-free access. However, Ukraine will eliminate its remaining tariffs of up to 5% on forestry products by 2024, 2022, sorry. So you might be wondering how to find out if your product faces any tariffs in the markets where Canada has FTAs. So for this, I wanted to show you Canada's tariff finder. It's a handy and fairly user-friendly tool that will help you to figure those tariffs out. Uh, all you need to begin is the market you're interested in and the product you want to export or import. And you can find your product by a harmonized systems code, uh, if you know it, or through a keyword search. 
And uh, I remind that this uh, tool is only valid for markets where Canada has free trade agreements. Uh, so when uh, exporting or importing products, uh, you need to take into account more than just tariffs. And to qualify for preferential treatment and uh, reduced or eliminated tariffs under the CUFTA, you have to prove that the country of origin of your product is Canada by completing the declaration of origin of your goods. But of course, these rules of origin can be complicated and uh, they are also product and agreement specific. And the good news is that uh, the CUFTA includes access to advanced ruling procedure on the origin of goods and also on tariff classification of goods. So if you are unsure whether your goods qualify as made in Canada, you will need to request an advanced ruling from the Ukrainian Customs Authority ahead of shipping your goods. And along with that, uh, the CUFTA also uh, addresses non-tariff barriers. Uh, these are often technical requirements and uh, different standards uh, between countries, such as certification procedures, labeling requirements, and other regulations related to human health and uh, animal and plant health. And they are, of course, important, but uh, if you are told that um, your product needs the same uh, testing in Canada and the Ukrainian market, and that kind of duplication may may become frustrating and may undermine the gains of those tariff reductions. Uh, fortunately, the CUFTA establishes mechanisms uh, that, under which Canada and Ukraine can discuss, prevent, and resolve uh, the unjustified non-tariff barriers. Uh, CUFTA also contains a dispute resolution mechanism that enforces obligations that Canada and Ukraine have signed on to. And overall, this gives you, um, as a business, more transparency, predictability uh, on technical requirements and other measures when, when doing business in, in the Ukrainian market. And of course, it's also expected uh, to lower your administrative costs over time. And uh, finally, a quick note on, uh, on exceptions. Uh, countries do maintain some exceptions in trade agreements when they want to protect their domestic producers. Uh, for example, uh, Canada under the CUFTA um, has excluded Canadian uh, supply managed products uh, like dairy, poultry and eggs. And this means that the free trade regime does not apply to those products originating in Ukraine and that import duty will continue to be applied under the most favored nation uh, rate. Uh, so the CUFTA also provides uh, you access to the government procurement in Ukraine. Uh, it gives you an ability to compete on a level playing field with local and international suppliers. And it also opens you more business opportunities in selling your products and services to public entities in Ukraine. And just as a reference, the Ukrainian government procurement market is estimated to be worth more than 20 billion US dollars annually. Uh, so again, uh, same as for uh, for the goods experts, uh, Kufta has provisions that help ensure that government procurement is transparent, impartial, accountable, and accessible by all businesses. And Kufta also lowers your costs associated with finding and applying to tenders. So what this means for you as a supplier of, of goods and services? Well, when bidding in any public procurement in an FTA market, it's important to know the coverage and the thresholds. So the coverage uh, means the type of procuring entities that FTAs cover. And in case of the CUFTA, these are the Ukrainian central government agencies, uh, departments, um, and other agencies. Uh, and second, uh, there are also airports, postal uh, services, and public transportation, uh, namely rail and subway systems. Uh, the thresholds are the amounts that the contract has to be above so that you can beat uh, from uh, as an FTA um, partner. And through the CUFTA, Canadian suppliers of goods and services can access procurement by Ukrainian uh, central uh, government agencies for contracts valued above uh, 170,000 US dollars and for construction services over 7 million US dollars. And this is, of course, reciprocal. And in terms of the Canadian market, Ukraine um, has the same access to Canadian central government procurement opportunities. So uh, the thresholds for goods and services contracts for airport, postal services, and public transportation are usually higher. And the good thing is that Ukraine has made its government procurement to Canadian companies very, very open. 
uh, meaning that there are very few exceptions of types of goods and services that are not covered. Um, finally, there is a link to the website here, uh, prozora.gov.ua. It's the Ukrainian open source database of public procurement, and its name Prozora comes from the Ukrainian word for transparent, and um, it's a four-year-old problem platform where you can find information on all tenders. But I'll stop here and we'll leave it to Adam to unveil its, its mechanics. So here is my uh, last slide with the trade support uh, resources and contact details. Uh, our trade policy and negotiations branch is here to support you and can help answer any questions you might have. And uh, we are also always interested to hear about any barriers that, that you are encountering in Canadian or international markets and we will seek to address them and can advocate with the federal government that they can that they be addressed. Uh, you can report a trade barrier directly to us or to the federal government through the online tool listed here in online resources box. Uh, this box also includes link to tariff finder that I showed you earlier in the presentation. Uh, next, I would like to highlight the trade readiness and services branch box and you will find uh, there is a link to the BC Expert Navigator program. Uh, that was mentioned by the uh, Minister of uh, State for Trade uh, earlier. And this program offers free support and guidance to help your business grow outside of BC. BC also has uh, its network of trade and investment representative offices. Uh, and um, it has offices in many countries, including Europe, uh, US and Asia Pacific. And they also assist companies to export their goods and services to specific markets. And finally, I invite you to follow us on social media channels to get the latest updates on different markets and the activities of our division. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. And before I pass it over to Adam, uh, I wanted to remind you that you can submit your questions in questions pane of the control panel. Uh, now it's over to you, Adam. Great, thanks very much, Ghana. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, as kind of said, my name is Adam Barbell. I'm a senior trade, commer uh, trade commissioner and commercial counselor based in Kyiv, Ukraine. And I manage a team of uh, four trade commissioners and a, a trade commissioner assistant. And we're all at your service to help support your companies for, uh, for doing business with Ukrainian companies. And on a personal note, it's a, it's a, as a British Columbian, as a Vancouver, right, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to speak with you today. I feel like I've come home in a way. I'm going to speak quite quickly uh, today because we've got a lot of ground to cover and uh, I, I want to make sure that we, we do justice to all, all parts, um, but the presentation will be available afterwards and, uh, and I'm always available for, for further discussions. So if we move to the overview, let's start by saying that uh, Ukraine isn't, well in fact uh, this is an overview of the presentation and, and so I'll begin by talking about how Ukraine isn't just uh, an Eastern European country for Canada. It's, it's a different relationship. And we'll talk a little bit about the Trade Commissioner Service, who we are and, and what we do. As Ghana mentioned, I'll go into a bit of detail on Prozoro, the public procurement system that uh, government of Ukraine has developed. I'll talk very briefly about Export Development Canada um, and what you can expect from them. Talk a bit about the uh, Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement, as, as Ghana um, foreshadowed, and successes, highlights, and opportunities that, that we see here uh, that have come out of that agreement. And then I'll dig into some specific sectors. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the opportunities that, that we see in agri-food, life sciences, um, defense and security, education, uh, ICT, manufacturing, um, principally. And, uh, and as Ghana mentioned at the end of all the presentations will uh, we'll cover uh, questions and answers. So Brand Canada. There are about 1.4 million Ukrainians in, in Canada or, or Canadian Ukrainians. President Zelensky, when he was elected, his first official visit was to Canada and in the middle of uh, parliamentary elections here, he took a break and spent three days in Canada on sort of the, which is a, a fairly significant time, as, as you can imagine, for somebody who's um, running an election campaign. And similarly, Minister Champagne, after he became Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, 
came to Ukraine for a three-day visit, which was the longest time he had stayed in any one country during his five years as a minister. You may remember that he was minister of international trade before becoming foreign minister. So the political ties between our two countries complement these people-to-people ties. Uh, We have in Ukraine the largest military training contingents. Uh, There's about uh, just over 200 uh, Canadian forces training the uh, Ukrainian forces in uh, in Ukraine. It's been going on for five years. We're now coming into our 10th rotation of, of Canadian troops. We have strong development in political programs. And of course, as Donna mentions, we, we have a, a U- the Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement. So Ukraine isn't just another Eastern European country for Canada. It's special. It's a deep, long, old relationship. And that serves Canadian companies extremely well. The Canadian brand here makes a makes an enormous difference. Um, at the Canadian Embassy here in, in Kyiv, we have a full suite of diplomatic tools, and to, including the Trade Commissioner's Service. I'll, I'll turn to that now. The Trade Commissioner's Service itself, I'll just have the next slide gone, thanks. It's 120 years old. We have 160 um, offices around the world, and we make a difference. Uh, Trade Commissioner Servants clients report 20% more uh, more markets and they sell 20% more, they export 20% more. Unlike uh, similar services in the United States, in the UK, in Australia, Switzerland, we do not charge a fee. Uh, we get rated through key performance indicators which are based on your success. So when you're successful, we're successful. We don't serve everybody. Our clients are companies with meaningful ties to Canada that support economic growth. And so, for example, we don't represent or or support authors, but we do publishing houses, uh, as an example. So we're we're really looking for benefits to Canada, to Canadians, because, of course, we're paid for by uh, taxpayers or services. And on the next slide, this, we provide really four key services. And we've got colleagues at the regional office in Vancouver who can help you prepare for international markets, make sure that you're export ready and, and help you think through that process of exporting if, if you don't have experience doing that already. Uh, here in Kiev, we can help you decide whether Ukraine is, is the right fit for your company. Uh, if there's a good match between what you're offering and, and what the market here is, is looking for. And then we do matchmaking, uh, where we will introduce uh, you and your company to Ukrainian counterparts and, and potential business partners. And similarly, we are approached by Ukrainian companies who are looking for um, products and services from Canadian companies. And so we can, we can match up the other way as well. Ukraine is not an easy market. Uh, it presents challenges on a number of different levels, and so we do a fair amount of problem solving. We have an exceptionally good track record based in, in large part because of this strong relationship that I spoke about earlier. Uh, but I think the important part is to know that, that we have your back and, uh, and, and have great success in, in helping Canadian companies. And, and I want to turn now to a, a, a video, and, and Ghana talked a bit about fish and seafood and the importance of British Columbian fish and seafood. I'm in Kiev, Ukraine, shopping at my local grocery store, and I am delighted to find a wide variety of Canadian fish and seafood. The freshness, texture, and flavor of these products has been preserved because Canadian fishers have on their boats the technology they need to freeze the fish just as soon as it's caught. Obviously, Ukrainians have recognized the high quality of the Canadian products because Ukraine is now the third largest export market for Canadian fish and seafood. If you're a Ukrainian company that imports fish and seafood, the Embassy of Canada is eager to work with you to identify Canadian suppliers. And that video is, um, that's the, the short version of the video. There's a much longer version of it where our ambassador then cooks two products um, using Canadian shrimp and Canadian hake. Uh, in fact, British Columbian shrimp and British Columbian hake um, with 
uh, Hector Jimenez, who is a Canadian chef here. He's in fact Ukraine's master chef. And, and so they go through this whole elaborate um, cooking process together. It's quite lovely to watch and, and I'm happy to make that available to you. I, I share these as an example of the sorts of, of effort that we go through to support um, Canadian companies in, and British Columbia companies in particular in their exports to Ukraine. Can export is another tool that's uh, that's available to you. And Can Export will provide up to 75% funding and up to $75,000 to explore new markets. And, and typically in past, this has been used for travel. Um, in sort of the COVID pandemic context, uh, they're certainly looking at, at more creative options. Surprisingly easy, frankly, for a government, uh, a government grant system, surprisingly fast. And so, it, it won't help you to hire staff, and it won't help you to sort of produce more of whatever you're producing. But if you want to take marketing materials, if you want to translate them to Ukrainian, if you want to um, engage in some way with the market, if you want to conduct a market study, um, these are all things that uh, can export can help you with. So I'd, I'd encourage you to, uh, to apply and take advantage of, of that. Now, Ghana mentioned that under the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement, you have access to the public procurement system, ProZoro. Um, and that's on the next slide. The Ukraine, Ukraine has one of the most transparent public procurement systems in the world. And, and I'm not just saying that, it, it was actually awarded the World Procurement Award, uh, recognized by Open Government Partnership. And, um, and you can access this, as I say, thanks, thanks to KUFTA. We've produced two different guidances. Uh, at least one of them is available in the handout section on, on this webinar. Um, and I'm happy to, to give you the links for the other, the other one. One is sort of a why you would want to use Prozoro, what's good about it, what's interesting. And, and that's where this, this slide comes from with the, the former first deputy minister who was actually the brainchild behind Prozoro, um, Max Nefyodov. And, uh, and the other one was done for us by Deloitte, and it is a, it's a technical guide. Um, Prozor is quite super, super transparent. So you can actually go back and see in the system who has exported to Ukraine in the past, what they've exported, um, what, they've, what bids they've made, what they've won, how much they've tendered for um, the full gamut. It's, it's, also, it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful tool. I'm happy to, to help share with you ways of accessing the, the various different um, bids that come up there. And, and in fact, on the next slide, you'll, you'll see that on average, there's not just 4,000 new tenders a day, but, but at a value of almost $100 million in new contracts every day. That's $33.6 billion a year in new contracts come up on, uh, on Prozoro. The state oil and gas company, Naftogas, they alone have an annual procurement budget of five billion U.S. dollars. So you can see that the the potential here is enormous. And to date, foreign companies represent about one percent of of successful bidders on Prozoro. And and that's not it's not because it's um, exclusive to domestic uh, to domestic buyers. It's, it's because largely um, other countries don't have free trade agreements like we do, and and because most other uh, most foreigners aren't aware of, of the ability to access these tenders through Preserve. So, so there's a huge, huge uh, potential there. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see that, um, that you need, I'd encourage you to bid more than once. So what Preserve has told us, the people who run it, is that people who bid will often bid once, find that they're not successful, give up and, and, and not try it again. As I say, it's a, it's a bit of a tricky system and it takes a few bids to, to work it out. What the Prozoro team has found is that people who bid three times are usually successful. Um, they have about a, a roughly a one in a one in three chance of, of getting a, a successful bid. And so I encourage you not to give up, to, to keep with it, learn how the program works, get used to it. And, and by the third time, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll win, a, win a bid. We get asked a lot about finance, uh, and in particular about Export Development Canada. 
Export Development Canada says that they are open in Ukraine on a restricted basis. This is their official official line. In concrete terms, this means that they provide about 50% cover on accounts receivable insurance to a value of a, more or less about a million dollars a year, which covers about 12 companies. So read into that uh, what you will. I would encourage you to apply uh, for, if you're looking for debt financing or for other, um, other insurance products that EDC covers. Um, I, I would encourage you to apply because what we often hear from them is that they don't, uh, that there aren't all that many applications and, and that's why um, they have such limited funding to Ukraine. Um, and, and I might suggest that you also copy your member of parliament when you apply. Enough said on Export Development Canada. Let me turn back to, to Clifton. I know that, that Ghana has gone into some, some detail, but I want to go into some specifics here. And, and so here are some success stories that we've, we've had. And, and I'm going to start with Ukrainian exports. So you'll see that in Canada, if you're buying imported apple juice, chances are there's a one in four chance that that imported apple juice is from Ukraine. 10% of imported anoraks, wind shooters, and wind jackets in Canada are from Ukraine. And, and interestingly, also snow skis, uh, about 6.5%. In the other direction, you see that over 70% of cold water shrimp imported into Ukraine come from Canada. Uh, similarly, 20% of diamonds and almost half of prepared cranberries imported into Ukraine are, are from Canada. So there is the percentage of, of total market share is, um, is significant, and, and that's what these, these numbers get to. Um, and BC, and, and again, I know Ghana mentioned fish and seafood before, and I've, I've shown you the video. It's, it's in part because BC exports more fish and seafood to Ukraine than the province exports wine globally. It's, it's a huge business for us here in, in Ukraine. Ukrainians love Canadian fish and seafood. And, and that's in part because of the competitive advantage that the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement uh, provides. And as Ghana talked about, there's, there's efforts now only three years into the, the new agreement to modernize. Um, the, the Ukraine Free Trade Agreement. Those initial pre-negotiations have already started. Uh, the, the parties have sort of shared baseline information back and forth. Canada is currently seeking a mandate to negotiate and Ukraine is particularly interested in services. There's no services chapter currently in, in Canada Ukraine Free Trade Agreement and also in investments. We do have a bilateral investment treaty uh, but Ukraine is interested in getting an investment chapter into the, the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement, uh, as well as some other things that we've learned over the past three years. And, but I think it really speaks to the importance and the value of our relationship that three years into the agreement, we're already looking at, at modernizing. And on the next slide, now, now this gets a bit technical, but again, it's, it's another piece of work that we've been doing here at the embassy. And it's to say, well, Essentially, we asked the, the question that Minister Chow asked at the beginning, which is, what's the specific advantage that you can get out of the, a, a free trade agreement like the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement? And so we commissioned a study that asked the question, where does Canada have a tariff advantage in Ukraine on commodities that Ukraine already imports, where can, Canadian companies already export either to Ukraine or to the region, somewhere in the neighborhood, but where Ukrainian companies are currently buying from countries that don't have a free trade agreement. And so we've identified these seven, and there's actually a list of about 50, but these are the top seven uh, commodities where we have a significant tariff advantage and uh, in the, uh, I think it's in the handout section here, you can get access to the full, uh, the full study that we've commissioned. And I'm certainly happy and, and my team is as well to, to talk you through those and, and get into some more specifics and where these opportunities might be. 
Opportunities, of course, aren't limited to this list. There's all kinds, um, many, many, but uh, but these ones, um, Canadian companies have a, have a particular advantage. So with that said about COFTA, let me, let me turn now to specific sectors. And I'm gonna start, not surprisingly, with, with agri-food. Um, as you saw, perhaps on the previous slide, there's, there's good strong demand for boneless pork. In fact, we're up this year 550% on boneless pork over last year. There's strong demand for alcohol and in particular wine. Um, we don't sell, Canada, Canadian companies don't sell wine in Ukraine at the moment. There, there isn't any on the market. There used to be ice wine for a while, but there isn't, there isn't any wine at the moment. Um, that's not for lack of demand. There is significant demand. Packaged food, we do extremely well on pet food, particularly high-end pet food. Off-season fruits and berries. Um, Ukraine is, uh, people often think of it as sort of a poor country, and, and I suppose in the European context, it's, it's not a wealthy one. In fact, it's, it's one of the poorest. Uh, but at a local supermarket the other day, a, a colleague of mine found a, a pint of uh, cherries, Canadian cherries, on sale for about a, the equivalent of 50 Canadian dollars. So, so there is money and there is interest. In, um, and as I said, dried cranberries, we do very well on it. It's, it's up about 237%. Ukrainians don't like GMO. It's sort of a European attitude towards, towards GMO. They're, they're not as sort of studious about it as, as the European, Western Europeans are, but, but there is an aversion to GMO in, in Ukraine. Um, and you don't need to worry about labeling. The importer takes care of all your labeling. So you just produce as you would normally produce export and then on packaged foods the uh, the importer will, uh, will handle the rest of that for you in terms of life sciences uh, we do extremely well in pharmaceuticals generic uh, medications in particular and vitamins over the past couple of years have been doing really well we're, we're up 426 percent this year in fact on on vitamins um, we do a good business in uh, aviation and the full gamut from from engines to struts to electrical control systems, you know, all sorts of different pieces. Defense is a new sector for us. We only really started into it two years ago and, and have really made significant progress. And that ranges everywhere from ammunitions to rifles. Uh, there's a lot of interest here in anti-drone technology, anti-damming uh, technology. There's of course a, a war with Russia. You wouldn't know it day to day. My family have got young kids who live in Kiev. You know, I mean, it's, it's like living in any major city. You wouldn't know at all that there was a, a war going on. Um, but there is, and, and that drives some interest in, in defense procurement. Uh, we do a very, very strong business in education. Uh, some K-12, a lot in colleges and, uh, and some camps as well, uh, particularly around English language education. We've got a, a market study available on, on that, if you're interested. Um, in terms of manufacturing, I, I have a, had an outstanding interest for um, aviation ball bearings. It's been kicking around for ages that we haven't been able to fill. Um, motor vehicles are up 100% over the last year. There's, there isn't a CE designation specifically required for Ukraine. Uh, but if you wanted to near shore um, or use the advantage, Ukraine has a, one of their only other free trade agreements is, uh, is with the European Union. And so if you wanted to use the Canada-Ukraine Ukraine free trade agreement to get stuff into Ukraine, assemble here, the labor is relatively inexpensive and then export to, to Europe, you can do that uh, under their free trade agreement, but, uh, but you would have to have some certification for that. But, but you don't need it for the Ukrainian market per se. For IT and tech, it's huge. Abs ICT and, and uh, computers are absolutely massive. Um, and, and we're really making some interesting progress in insure tech, uh, technology for the insurance sector and, and banking as well. Canadian credibility takes us a, a long way on this. And we've done a, a market study on cybersecurity. I mean, I often say it's a Canadian. Uh, cybersecurity companies and, and ICT companies in the cyber war for cybersecurity space that if you're not in Ukraine, you're not in the game. It's, uh, 
it's a it's a fascinating fascinating space to be in and there's a lot to learn here and a lot to contribute um, so uh, so if you're interested in that we can certainly help you out and finally as i as i run out of time here please call text email uh, ask questions propose ideas it, it won't cost you anything um, and it might even make you some money in in the process um, our challenge in Ukraine isn't finding opportunities for BC and Canadian companies. Our challenge is finding uh, Canadian companies that will take up the opportunities that, are, that exist here. So there is, uh, there is no shortage of, of business to be done. And, and, and I want to stress again that the, the embassy here has your back and, and we take a very, very hands-on approach if you want it um, to help guide Canadian companies through the market, find opportunities and support them uh, as, uh, as they develop their business opportunities. And with that, I will uh, thank you for your time and your attention and turn it over to Petr Petrenko, who is the Councillor at the Embassy of Ukraine to Canada. Petr. Thank you, Adam. Uh, well, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Petro Petrenko. I'm Trade Commissioner Councillor in the Embassy of Ukraine in Canada. Well, thank you, Hanna, and the government of British Columbia for the event. It's terrific to join virtually. Honestly, I'd rather be there. Hope well to visit beautiful British Columbia someday. Uh, on the next uh, slide, there is a, well, uh, my presentation in brief. Uh, I will share with you what we exactly do in the embassy in Ottawa, why we find British Columbia important to Ukraine in terms of trade, and we'll be happy to answer your questions afterwards. Uh, next slide, uh, well, uh, Embassy in, uh, of Ukraine in Canada trade team has similar tasks to our colleagues in Kyiv. We help businesses to find their best possible deals, enter new markets and expand. We provide advice, guidance, contacts and our expertise. We work mainly with Ukrainian exporters and Canadian companies that are looking to import from Ukraine. All this is happening mainly in Ottawa, but right in Vancouver, we are lucky to have an honorary consulate headed by Mir Lubomir Gutsulak, honorary consul of Ukraine. Well, some of you may know him already. Mir helps us in BC if needed, and I think he is with us right now. Supporting exporters became even more important during COVID-19. Uh, luckily, neither Canada nor Ukraine have or had export restrictions. This matter was acknowledged and praised also during the recent e-meeting between Ambassador of Ukraine, Andriy Shevchenko, and the Honorable Mary In, Minister of Small Business, Export Promotion, and International Trade. Well, uh, we are also lucky and proud to have the Free Trade Agreement, which was mentioned uh, for several times now. Uh, Hannah and Adam have already explained its benefits. I will mention only one thing. When presenting the agreement, the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, said that together with the FTA, with the European Union, Canada now has a trade in space that goes from Vancouver all the way to Kharkiv in Ukraine. Another important step that our countries made to boost cooperation and trade was uh, signing the Audiovisual Cooperation Agreement. We think that this agreement, once ratified, creates new and exciting opportunities to attract foreign investment, increase production budgets, and promote both of our cultures internationally. So follow the news. Once the agreement enters into force, we will be happy to explain it and in detail and promote. Now, very briefly about BC importance for Ukraine in terms of trade. For Ukrainian producers of goods, British Columbia is the third largest trading partner in Canada after Ontario and Quebec. It is encouraging to see that the westernmost province of Canada and Ukraine, which is almost 9,000 kilometers away, are doing well in terms of trade. Now, what are the top three single goods that British Columbia is buying in Ukraine? Number one goes to gas turbines that most of the time are at the top of the commodity list, at least for the last five years. Different Ukrainian metal products, iron bars and rods in particular, are number two. And finally, Ukrainian furniture, especially seats convertible into beds, have the third place in this top three export commodities list. In services, as we speak, almost 200,000 Ukrainian ICT specialists are working hard to provide 
for class services, also to Canadian companies. Uh, last year, trade turnover between Ukraine and Canada in services rose by 8%. More than 50% of this trade was in uh, ICT. In general terms, our trade is fairly diversified, I would say, and we see much room for improvement as well. I shall highlight some additional options for you to consider. Ukraine is undergoing major modernization, as it was already mentioned, and apart from what my colleagues have already pointed, I encourage you to have a closer look at the land reform in Ukraine. In general terms, land market of Ukraine gradually opens for foreign businesses uh, to invest. At next slide, please. At the end, let me reveal the strategic asset of, asset of Ukraine in Canada, which, as Adam already mentioned, is 1.3 million of Ukrainian Canadians. This is almost 4% of Canada population and almost 17% of them live in British Columbia. With this astonishing statistics, I want to end my presentation and to thank you for your patience, attention and interest in Ukraine. And I also invite you to visit Ukraine individually or a as a part of a trade mission, let's say. Uh, some time ago, Minister Bruce Ralston, once he was the Minister of Jobs, Trade and Technology, planned such a visit to Ukraine. We hope that new Minister of Jobs, Economic Development and Competitiveness, Honorable Michel Mungal, will take over this and bring this VC business to Ukraine. Now, that's my pleasure to give the floor to Svetoslav Kavetsky, Executive Director of Canada-Ukraine Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Svetoslav. Thank you, Petra. Dear organizers, participants, previous speakers gave you a lot of insights related to trade volume between BC, Canada, and Ukraine, specific sectors that have the most potential. I will try to briefly describe the CECC's activities, services, and benefits you may gain from cooperation with us. I'm gonna next slide, please. Uh, the Canada Ukraine Chamber of Commerce was formally incorporated in 1992 and is dedicated to supporting trade and investment between Canada and Ukraine. CECC is recognized by all levels of government in Canada and Ukraine, by the business community in both countries, and by the public in general as a facilitator agency of choice for establishing, maintaining, and monitoring bilateral business relations, trade, and investment opportunities between Canada and Ukraine. We are a broad-based organization bringing together companies as the business gateway be between in Ukraine and Canada. Next slide, please. The Ukrainian market is complex and not without its nuances. While some of them might be unique to your industry, most of them are likely very much common for most Western enterprises establishing their footprint in modern Ukraine. To assist our members with resolution of these issues, CUCC works on their cases both individually and collectively by engaging key officials of the Ukrainian government and Canadian government, various industrial bodies and trade organizations. We believe that by joining our organization, you will get a significant deal of value-added benefits that will facilitate your business with Ukraine. CCC developed and maintains a full program of services and activities. We promote Ukraine as a place to do business, encourage Canadian companies to operate and invest in Ukraine, engage in supporting businesses to fully understand and benefit from the Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement, support trade, marketing and investment opportunities in Canada for Ukrainian companies. Currently, with the QDIS project support that I will to tell you more a bit later, CCC is actively working on launching brand new website, marketing campaign to address Ukrainian and Canadian stakeholders, populating trade and investment portal, another uh, pro product that was developed with Kiddish support, and GR activities aimed at strengthening of the Chamber's position as a reliable gateway to do business between the two countries. Our staff is English speaking and is able to provide you with the necessary advice over the phone or via email, Zoom or other communication platforms. Next slide, please. The Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement sends a powerful message that Ukraine is open for business and offers significant trade and investment opportunities. With, with KUFTA in full effect, Canadian and Ukrainian businesses alike can fully benefit from the countless opportunities for increased trade, growth and investment. Next slide, please. KUFTA is one of the largest milestones in both countries' bilateral relations. 
agreement creates commercial benefits for Canadian businesses. There is a great potential in agriculture and agri-food industries, especially for fish and seafood, iron and steel manufactured goods, agricultural machinery, aerospace components, plastics and cosmetics. CAFTA also provides companies with preferential access to procurement opportunities at the central government level in both countries. Uh, at the beginning of this year, GEC con conducted public consultations. We also gave our feedback and suggestions to on CAFTA's modern modernization. Areas that both parties are working on are cross-border trade and services, financial services, investment, and ICT. But what is trade, free trade agreement without trade? With export totaling less than 1% of each country's respective GDP over the last decade at the time that the document was signed, it was decided that the government-sponsored trade program would be necessary to facilitate the trade needed to justify free trade agreement. The Canada-Ukraine Trade and Investment Support Project, CUTIS, with offices in Toronto and Kiev, was launched in 2016. And I must underline the importance of the CUTIS project as an important tool to the success of the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement. Next slide, please. CUTIS has been, uh, CCC has been administering CUTIS project along, along with Conference Board of Canada and is one of the project's main sustainability pillars. CUTIS project's main objective was to educate and train Ukrainian small and medium businesses on how to use benefits of CUFTA to trade with Canada, what is corporate social responsibility, why it is important to address gender equality and environmental issues. Women-led and environmentally friendly businesses enterprises were especially encouraged by the CUTIS experts. CUTIS produced a number of export training guides and materials on how to export to Canada in specific areas. ICT furniture, footwear, apparel, confectionery, guides on regulatory and other Canada-specific standards. Another object of CUTIS activities was work with Ukrainian government authorities responsible for trade and development. Next, let me address another CUTIS CUCC product, Trade and Investment Portal. Next slide, please. Portal is a website that is developed under the CUTIS project to assist businesses to match with each other and facilitate communication. The trade and investment web portal aims at improving network between Ukrainian and Canadian companies. We focus on the most interesting and prospective products and services. CUCC will continue providing maintenance and support of the portal after the CUTIS project ends. Currently, we are populating the portal with profiles of the companies that have been working or are doing business between the two countries. Most of these, these businesses benefited from the CUTIS organized training and educational sessions. These year, Ukrainian companies, thanks to CUTIS, had the benefit of both gender equality and environmental expert trainings. They understand the importance of corp corporate social responsibility, advantage and gain that can be made thanks to it. Next slide, please. CUTIS participated or helped, uh, CCC participated or helped organize various events such as forums, conferences, workshops in Ukraine and Canada. In the last five years, over 1,000 Ukrainian businessmen and businesswomen visited Canada as a members of various organized or supported missions. This year is very different for all of us because of COVID-19. Most of the major events that were planned had to be postponed or changed their form to online. But we stay optimistic. And once things get back to, no, to at least new normal, we will keep on conducting business missions to Canada, expanding participation of the Ukrainian companies in major Canadian fairs and conferences. We will continue to participate in such shows as uh, Global Energy Show in Alberta, Mining and Natural Resources Show PDEC in Toronto, Processed Food and Agribusiness CL, which is held in Montreal and Toronto, information and communication technology conferences and other. We intend to conduct similar events for Canadian businesses and government authorities to visit Ukrainian key international shows. Next slide, please. Lastly, I would like to mention a few ex existing success stories of Canadian investment into Ukraine. Uh, Fairfax company has acquired ownership of the biggest Ukrainian insurer in AXA Direct. They bought a Ukrainian part of the French insurer and few other investments into insurance business and agriculture. Black Iron is a Canadian iron ore exploration and development company advancing its 100% owned Shemanyevsky project located, located in Kravyri, Ukraine, to production. Total value, project value estimated at over $1 billion. TIU Ukraine is a little, leading solar power producer in Ukraine with two solar plants of 10.5 and 13.5 uh, megawatts stations. Brookfield entered Ukrainian market with construction of Innovation District IT Park in Lviv. 
The property will include several uh, business centers, university building, hotels, shopping mall, and additional amenities. Uh, Ukrainian Ukraine represents two extraordinary market highlights, brains and grains. Historically, Ukraine was known as a bread box basket of Europe, but in recent times it has become, become known as a brain basket, not only of Europe, but at the forefront of IT globally. It is surpassing countries like India and Philippines for outsourcing IT support and solutions. For example, national brand name Canadian Tire has its IT support handled in Ukraine. In fact, internationally recognized applications such as WhatsApp, PayPal, PetCube, Grammarly were created in part by Ukrainians. There are a number of Ukrainian ICT companies with physical presence in Ukraine, and this number is growing. To name a few, SoftServe, Alex, Sigma Software, Informational System Security Partners. Next slide, please. CSU is a well-established chamber in terms of government contacts in both Ukraine and Canada. We administered QDIS project with Conference Board of Canada and in close contact with Global Affairs Canada, Canadian Embassy Kiev. We have an established history of relationship with most provincial governments here in Canada. We work closely with the Ukrainian government, Prime Minister's Office, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Economy and Devel Development and Trade, Ukrainian Invest Agency, Export Promotion Office, and others. Next slide, please. Uh, should you have any additional questions, please do not hesitate to contact our office. You can see the contact details on the slide. Then the Ukraine Chamber of Commerce will be happy to assist you with all your inquiries related to business between Ukraine and Canada, provide expert advice and support. We have different levels of membership you can choose from. Uh, Women-led and environmentally conscious businesses can benefit from the higher level of membership with no additional fee. All necessary information will be provided to you upon contact in our office. Thank you very much for your attention and interested interest in today's webinar. Thank you, Gana. And now I will hand it over to Ben Kolisnik, who will run our Q&A session. Thank you very much, Sotoslav. Uh, thanks everyone for your presentations. Uh, we have uh, uh, not too much time remaining here for questions, so I'm going to uh, go through them as quickly as I can. And um, I'm going to combine some of the questions that have come in today during the session uh, with those that came in during registration. I'm seeing some themes and some overlap there, so hopefully we can save a bit of time. Uh, the first set I, I think are probably best, uh, would be best to go to you, Adam. Uh, some of these you may be able to speak to uh, right now and others are maybe a little more technical and may require uh, some follow-up. Um, the first set, I think, are really around finding uh, strategic partners and buyers and distributors, which I know you touched on a little bit already, but maybe you can go into a little more detail about what that might look like. Um, and these have come in from really a wide range of industry. I see some, some questions like this coming from, uh, uh, from packaged food companies, um, from technology companies, um, and even, I guess, education. Maybe we can talk about education a little bit um, later separately. But um, is there anything more you could say on that, Adam? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks very much for the question. So there, there's two kind of different types of, of relationships, the, the strategic partners and the buyers. On strategic partners, the first thing to say is that we don't offer due diligence service, that, that the responsibility for the partnership rests with, uh, with you, with, with your company. What we do is we have an established network of, of contacts, and, and that's really the principal job of my team, is to spend their days out uh, meeting with various different companies and various different people, getting to know them, getting to know their interests, um, and, and advancing sort of Canadian partnership opportunities. And so we have a, a very, very significant sort of network of, of individuals and companies that um, that are interested in, in working with Canada that have something to offer. And so, for example, there was a, a company that does um, way in motion technology, and they were they told us they were interested in the Ukrainian market. We went out to our network, identified a local e electronics uh, company, and they're now working on a, a, a multi-million dollar bid after having done successfully done a previous multi-million dollar contract together. 
So, so on the strategic partnerships, that part is, um, again, there's a, there's a due diligence aspect that, that we encourage companies to go through, but, but we're happy to provide references, introductions, um, and, and we will accompany if, uh, if the company desires during the first initial stages of that relationship to make sure that it, it, it runs smoothly. On buyers, again, uh, it's a different kind of a, uh, an activity, but, but we also there have a very extensive network. So um, on agri-food in particular, we work very closely with the largest supermarket chains. Uh, we've got great relationships with the buyers at those supermarket chains, and we can help place a product sort of off the start. So if you're looking for a high-end exclusive product that you're trying to get into market, then we we have supermarkets and, and buyers who focus, and in fact, distributors as well, who focus on that market. If you're looking for sort of a lower end commodity, Hake uh, is, a, is an example, big one out of BC. So a lower value commodity. We have other stores that, that deal with volume as opposed to, um, to price. And so it's really about us using our networks, identifying some uh, some potential partners. We reach out to those partners here, make sure that they're interested in receiving an offer from British Columbia, and then we'll go back to you and and, and make the match uh, between your company and theirs. You can explore that, no obligation, of course. And uh, and if it doesn't work out for whatever reason, we're happy to find others and, and keep sort of working through until you find a partnership that works for you and that you're comfortable with. Great, thank you, Adam. So it sounds like that's uh, something that uh, you know businesses can do across the board, whether they're uh, uh, in food or, or technology. I see there's quite a few questions here coming from the technology side. So uh, I think you mentioned earlier people can reach out to you directly to uh, uh, to start that process. Absolutely, please. And and I should say that on my team, I mentioned we've got four trade commissioners and the trade commissioner assistant. Each trade commissioner has their own sector specialization. Um, and so they know, for example, we have somebody who specializes in education, fish and seafood, or in defense industries. And so they, they have their own particular networks. They know the industry here extremely well and, and with quite a bit of depth. And, and so we can really help pinpoint, pinpoint in, but, but I'm happy to be your first point of contact. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I'm going to direct the next set of questions to you as well, Adam. There's uh, There's been some questions around wine. Now, you mentioned wine in your presentation. Uh, you talked about how there's no lack of demand in Ukraine for wine, but that uh, we weren't currently exporting any wine. So I think maybe um, the question is is why that is. What are the, what are the hurdles, if any? Um, there have been some questions here around uh, regulations and taxes and duties around exporting Canadian wine to Ukraine. I don't know if uh, maybe Adam and, and Ghana as well, if there's anything you either of you want to say on that. Sure, I'm happy to kick that off and then and then hand it to you, Ghana, if you like. On, in terms of the, the duties and specific regulations, we looked into this quite closely for the whiskey market. And, um, and so I'm not as familiar with uh, with wine, you could use Terra Finder uh, if you know the HS code for uh, for your product and uh, and see um, whether there's a specific duty. I don't think there are, um, but but you can have a look. And uh, and we're happy. You know, we're, we can do the research at this end for you to find out if there's any import restrictions. There are sometimes on food certificates that are required uh, that kind of thing. We, we can certainly do that that research here for you. Why hasn't there been to date? Um, it's, it's not for lack of demand at, at this end. And it's, it's a question that I've asked uh, back to our headquarters team uh, a couple of times and have been told that, that largely it's because Canadian companies don't export one, that domestic supply is sort of sufficient. And if we do export, it's, it's to sort of China and Japan. So, so that's the main reason we haven't pursued it. But, so there is, we do have some hard alcohol in market. And, and I'll give you an example. Ukraine makes phenomenally good vodka. Um, I mean, really, really good vodka. There is a Canadian brand of vodka that is frankly not very 
Good, but it has a Canadian maple leaf on it. And so it sells and, and it does relatively well here. So the Canadian brand by itself will, will help sell that product. So we would love to support uh, support wine and, and I'll, I'll tell you very sort of transparently why that is in, in addition to of course it's our job to, to help uh, British Columbian and, and Canadian companies export but because because having wine on the shelf is and, and BC makes phenomenally good wine it's a it's a calling card it, it helps our brand and it helps advertise the presence of Canada it's it's one thing to have, you know, polythermal plastics that are in market, and, and, and that's wonderful. But, but Ukrainian consumers don't see that, and they don't see the Canadian brand, and, and so we're very motivated to to help you get your wine into into market, and we have extremely good connections with the, uh, the various different alcohol um, distributors and, and sellers here. And I'm confident we can we can help your business. Yeah, thanks, Adam. I just wanted to add uh, that uh, Kufta has actually eliminated the the tariffs, uh, the Ukrainian tariffs on uh, Canada's wine and also on ice wine. Um, so there should be no uh, no taxes, no no duties on uh, on that side. And also the ice wine, uh, the geographic indication, uh, geographical indication as ice wine has been has been protected under Kufta uh, in different spellings. Uh, so that should not be an issue either. But again, as Adam was saying on on the regulation side, there might be some some things that his team would like to to look into. Great, thank you, Gana. Um... Okay, so there, there again, Adam. I know you talked about education in your presentation. There have been several questions that have come in on on the education sector, and I'm not sure if there's anything else you 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 can say on that uh, at this point. But specifically, I think people are interested in uh, whether, I guess, what the level of interest there is in Ukraine uh, offshore British Columbian uh, accredited schools that teach the BC curriculum. Um, and I think, um, you know, maybe that's something that they can follow up with you directly on or, or unless you have something else you want to add. Sure. I, I would just add that it, it's a, uh, what do I call it now? I think it's a representative based market, which is that there are, um, Ukrainian agent based markets. So there are Ukrainian education agents and, and quite a number of them. And, and that's really how people get into the market uh, is through these agents. Um, the, not every market I understand works like that in education, but Ukraine definitely does. You, you just pick up an agent. We're happy to introduce you to a, to a handful of, of the better ones um, to, to develop that relationship. Then again, I go back to the Canadian brand. I mean, there's, there's a school here that teaches to the Manitoba curriculum. There's, um, so there's a variety of different opportunities in terms of bringing British Columbian education and curriculum to uh, to Ukraine. I we had a, a couple of school boards explore that opportunity here from BC, and there's there's a thing about how um, I think students have to be physically present in British Columbia um, under BC law, or, or at least that was the case a, a year or so ago. So. So I think principally what you're looking at is students traveling to either physically or virtually to, to Canada to participate in, in Canadian curriculum. Certainly demand for that. Again, I go back to this uh, sort of the reputation of Ukraine as being a, a relatively poor country. I was in Tchaikovsky, which is a um, town of about 200,000 people, I think, and meeting with an education agent there who was had toured me around a local high school where 60% of their graduating students studied overseas. And, and I was asking him as, as we were meeting later in his office, how is it that, that a town of 200,000 people can have a high school where 60% of their graduating students can afford to, to study overseas? And, uh, and he gave me sort of an ambiguous, not very compelling answer. And, and as I left his office, I walked down the stairs from his office and opened the door and there was a Maserati parked directly outside um, the door of his office. And I don't think it was his car, but, but there is sufficient wealth here to create um, enough, uh, enough opportunities that it's, that it's worth the time. We do uh, very, very well at trade fairs. 
Canada is the number one choice Ukrainians for uh, abroad. Not everybody can afford to, to study in Canada. So I, I think actually Poland does better in terms of numbers than we do. But, um, but if Ukrainians had their choice, Canada is the first one. So, and, and again, happy to dig more into specifics with, with anybody afterwards. Great opportunities in education. Thank you. Um, Petro, I just want to, to um, see if, if you have anything you'd like to add on, on this question. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, is there anything uh, you would add? Uh, well, uh, I know that at this moment, uh, uh, Canadian universities have shared their, their, uh, their experience in e-learning or distance learning with the Ministry of Education in Ukraine. And if that is successful, the Canadian system of learning uh, distance in distance could be implemented in some Ukrainian universities. That's that's it just shows that we are we are in constant dialogue. We are we are learning from each other, and we are trying to to take the best from from each side. Great, thank you, thank you both. Uh, we are we're running out of time here. Um, I think uh, we're not going to get through all of the questions that have come in. So maybe I'll just uh, uh, pose one uh, or two more to you, Ghana. Um, they're sort of uh, focused on uh, back to the uh, the question of tariffs and goods and and uh, you know the types of barriers that uh, might exist there or. or uh, that might have been eliminated under the free trade agreement. So um, there's been some specific questions around uh, demand and market access for fresh and frozen berries. And I know berries were mentioned several times during the presentations, but um, is there anything you want to say specifically on, on other berries um, in terms of tariffs and demand? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Ben. Uh, so, of course, depending on the on the variety of um, of berries and then whether they are fresh, frozen, or otherwise preserved, uh, there might be different tariffs or lack of tariffs uh, for fresh blueberries, for example. Um, prior to Kufta, there was a tariff of twenty percent on on the berries, uh, but it has been already reduced, phased out to ten percent from January 2020, so it's very, very recent as an opportunity, and it will be completely phased out by 2024, meaning that the blueberries, for example, the fresh blueberries will not face any tariff and will have a competitive advantage over, over other suppliers. And for frozen blueberries, um, they stopped facing tariffs since this January 2020, so that's already a, a huge step and a, a huge advantage that the Canadian and BC companies can take um, can take on board. And you can actually look up uh, the tariffs for, for the products using the um, tariff finder uh, tool, uh, or you can also send us uh, a quick email and we can do that for you. Thank you. Okay, last question, Gana. Uh, tariffs on dairy products. What uh, is the situation there? Uh, yeah, so the, uh, for the dairy products, um, as I've mentioned, the, um, can, uh, the Canadian uh, supply managed products, which include dairy, uh, they have been excluded from, uh, from the agreement, from the Kufta, uh, means that uh, the free trade regime does not apply to, to those products and they continue to, to trade uh, under the uh, most favored nation uh, rate tariff. Uh, but Ukraine's uh, tariffs on Canadian dairy um, they actually uh, vary by product as well. And they will be either uh, phased out over time or significantly reduced through, through the Kufta. But again, it depends on the, on the actual product and we'll be happy to, to look it up for you and to, to see what are the exact um, tariffs, tariff rates uh, or lack of thereof for, for your product. Great, and people can also go to that tariff finder tool that's been mentioned a few times now, and that can be used for imports and exports. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to... If I may. Yes, of course, please. Uh, I would like to add, add a few words to educational matter. Uh, there's an, also a market, not for only for uh, university aged students in Canada to study in Canada, but also school students 
uh, we've got a, we've got in quite lately that the like Ukrainian uh, private school market is booming at the moment, and a lot of parents are ready to send their kids for summer vacations to, for example, Canada to study English language, and, and there's also a room to for cooperation in this matter. Great, thank you for adding that. I thank. Thanks uh, everyone for uh, for uh, responding to those questions. Um, as I said, we've sort of run out of time here, so I'm going to turn it back over to you, Gala. Yeah, thank you, Ben, uh, Svetoslav, Petro, and uh, Adam, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. It's been it's been a pleasure to have you at uh, the webinar doing business in Ukraine and uh, the Canada Ukraine Free Trade Agreement and Market Opportunities for for BC companies. We hope that it was a useful one. And if you have any uh, any further questions, please contact us at the contact details that you have seen um, in the presentations. Uh, the presentation will be shared with you as well as the the recording and the handouts. Uh, we will also uh, send you a survey and would appreciate if you uh, would complete that and provide your feedback on today's session. And uh, with that, on behalf of, of the BC government and uh, our presenters, thank you for joining us today and uh, have a great rest of your day.